when we put our bare feet on the ground, you know, 20,000 years ago, and, you know, we weren't the dominant species on Earth. We had a lot of senses. We smelled the wind, and, you know, we knew when there was rain in the air, and we could smell the feces of other animals because it meant our lives. Well, when you plan and execute a bank robbery, it means your life. Whether by getting caught, spending your life in prison, and or being killed. saying that, you know, first you get lucky and then you get good because you go into a bank robbery and it's just, ah, what am I doing, you know, and, and, and somebody's leaping over the counter and, uh, and then get out and get the money and what just happened, you know, because nobody, you know, thinks it. And so you get, you, you survive a few of those and then um, you start to go into a time which is really, you enter, I used to call it lizard time and it's a, you know, it's, you're on old brain. I would literally transform walking into a bank. I would literally feel that transformation coming over me. I was walking into a situation which demanded that I inhabit time in the way possibly our ancestors did 30 or 40 or 50,000 years ago when, you know, when, you're, when you're living in a place of grave danger. So time was something you could bite. I mean, it was there. It wasn't something that's like this invisible thing that we have now. It was, it was something that's a part of me. It was like a band that went through the room. We became known as the Stopwatch Gang for a very small number of banks that I actually did with a stopwatch was, um, I think, less than five that I actually did with a stopwatch. You know, when we've got, you know, something like 140 notches in our belt over, over a period of time. Armored car robberies and airport robberies and banks. We were always looking at people's schedules. I mean, I, you know, there was a time when I probably spent as much time in a bank as most employees do or around it, just watching and seeing what people are doing and, and then figuring out a way to subvert it. I used to have these stopwatches because that's my reasonable, rational mind. After a bank robbery and in between bank robberies, I said, oh, I could do this better. Oh, well, we'll get a stopwatch and hang it upside down over my neck, come through the door. Half the time I'd forget to punch it or I'd never look at it through a bank robbery. And I, I don't think I ever used it. We just ended up with this name that that ended up defining us as, a, as and ended up defining a lot of my life because this thing that I never ever used because I had a way better one. You know, I had a way better one. I had one that was given to me when I was born. When we recollect our lives, we recollect moments of our lives. Our reference points for our entire lives will be a moment. I have a lot of excitement in my life. For some strange reason, those aren't strong memories. I have memories 
that are, you know, that are more, a lot more involuntary. I have, and I have a lot of those because of the life I've led. You know, I was taught things uh, in, and treated in a sexual way by a man that, you know, the things that no child should ever have to experience or know these things. And I think that it changes and interrupts my sense of time and who I am and freezes me in some ways. An adult stole something from me. You know, he. You know, he took me for a couple of years and he introduced me to drugs and he introduced me to things that I should never know. He stole something from me and he, he, I was malformed. I've carried that through my entire life. And it's because they took a point of time and I was left as 11. people, a lot of them don't like young people. They'll talk about them in their baggy pants and their awful music and their this and their that. But what they don't like, what they really don't like is they have something that you can't buy, you know, that you can't have, that it's not ever yours again. And they have that thing. And I think there's a resentment there. I think we, we have a resentment towards you know, those beautiful young people that are just bursting alive. I mean, there's no such thing as a as an ugly 13-year-old person. They're just, they're beautiful people. They just, they move in a way and they, they just have everything, you know, and they have everything that we at 50 and 60 don't have. You know, when I think back and look at my time of wandering, it sort of, it kind of fit with, you know, it, at a time I left home when I was around 13 pretty well, you know, back and forth a little bit, but left home pretty well for good and was on the road from, from that time on. It was, and I'd left, you know, in a sense of, of education and lived on the street. So there, you know, my times were different. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd gone through some very extensive, you know, uh, sexual interference in my life and, some really strange things and, and so when I went out as a 13 year old and was living in Vancouver and, and living in a drug subculture and is instead of you know my career was you know my career was a, was a, was was as an addict Being a heroin addict, that's a full-time job. Being a junkie is a, is a full-time job. And for many years in my life, I, had a, I was on a four-hour cycle. And that really changes, you know, the way we grow older, the way we mature or don't in, in the case of that. Because, you know, I, I, when I get into an addiction cycle, that's where I am. I'm back to being on living every four hours. Life will be better in four hours. I'll quit this in four hours. My life will become normal four hours from now, you know. And, of course, in four hours from now, what I'm concerned about is having a gain. It's usually comfort and safety that, that we seek in our life. You know, it's somewhat some pleasure. And addiction is an extreme example, but it's a great example. When I began to be addicted, it was, you know, it was, it was wonderful. It was, you know, the, I, like I felt joy and I felt communion with all things. I, and I was safe. I was safe. I had this warm, you know, heroin's this really warm blanket around you. And even though the world still goes on out there, it can't hurt you anymore.
the consequences of being an addict for me from 13 through till till I started being put in jail at at 16 and and through till 20 when it started to get really serious and 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 now there were some real sort of discouraging times of being an addict. Prior to that, it was all it was just kind of a blur of fun. I was kind of living a, a, a kid's dream. You know, I'm 15 years old, I'm immortal. You know, you gotta come with silver bullets to get me. And that's the way kids think at 15, 16. For periods of my life, since I was a very young man, I have been, be, as a consequence of what I do, which is, is, is rob banks, I'm taken and put into prison. A choice is made for me, you know, by a court, you know, because my life has become unmanageable and I'm a threat to the community, that I have to be removed from that community. So that the same choice as if someone going, standing up in their office cubicle at the age of 21 or 20 and saying, I've had enough, I can't take it. I'm gonna go sit on the mountaintop or I'm gonna go uh, and build a, a little hut in the interior somewhere and, and sit for a while and think about this. That was forced upon me. This is my third monster bit that I've done. I'm doing an 18-year sentence right now. It's the third, you know, it's the shortest of the three that I've done. I've been in, you know, the places like Marion, Illinois, and Millhaven, and Kingston Penitentiary, and I've been locked in the holes in solitary for years, and there's places where um, it's, you know, I can be, um, some of it's very, very difficult to endure. I've also been very free in some of those places. It's an ironic thing that, that being sent to prison, having that, that choice made for you because of these other things, actually puts you into a place of contemplation and you break free of the time. The word penitentiary comes from the word penitence, which is to give you time to go and think about your sins. We were originally put in these places and we used to wear bandanas overhead. You could never look or speak to anyone. It was all silence. You were in small little cells and you were to contemplate your trespasses against the community. All of these cells are built the same way. You can walk seven steps. You walk seven steps and then you turn. And you walk seven steps this way and you turn. When I walk that seven steps for those hours, that puts me into the meditative state, you know, a place where I am walking the earth and a place where my thoughts begin to untangle. And that means something. It means that you mindfully put one foot in front of the other in the natural rhythm of your body. And you'll be present here while you're, while you're moving. As a young, uh, young man, as a prisoner, you know, I sat and, and it was always about my sentence ending or about my next escape. Because things would get better then, you know, things would be all right then. On the short term, it was about when I get the next load of drugs in and pass the, 
you know, over the wall sort of thing. But on the, on the long term, when my sentence ended, you know, life would begin again, etc. Or when I, you know, as soon as I could escape, everything would get better. So you're waiting for that joy that's outside of you, and, and, and you're waiting for that to come. You're waiting for that, the relief of your own suffering to come. And then we can, we can take that through every, every degree that there is. And that's where we're, we're waiting for retirement. So I have, I release me from the suffering of my work. Um, I'm, I'm waiting to be, I'm waiting for salvation because that's going to be relieving me of the suffering of being human. And while we're standing around waiting for all these things, life is going on and happening all around us. And, and but we're waiting for something that's the the next or subsequent or best thing, and and that's excruciating. As the years went by, and as I, you know, gathered some new perspectives, and I perceived time and some new perceptions on time, you know, I, I, you know, I still want to get out. You know, you still have a sense of looking forward to that. But I also realize that what I have is now, and that you know, the life that's that's here, and and it's a really um, concrete kind of example of how we put our our lives on hold, because in actuality, my life has been put on hold. I've been you know, sort of put in this place where I'm supposed to be and I'm supposed to just not really exist. But no one's taken any time away from me. I'm sentenced to place. I got all my own time, you know, and I can do some very important and valuable things from here. Things that matter to, you know, things that contribute, matter, are significant to me, to my family, to my community, to our culture. I'm free to do all of that. All understanding in life comes from a, a, a retrospection. We seldom understand something as we're passing through it. At the age of 30, I was finding myself reflecting on my life. You know, I had lived a very um, energetic, <laughs> a very energetic life. I had escaped three times, uh, you know, uh, I had risen to sort of to the top of, of my criminal profession and, and et cetera. And, um, and I had found myself back in a prison cell in Canada and I'm in, just in my early 30s at the time, and there's a distance between me now and, and my life. I'm not, you know, I tried again to go out to the big yard. I tried again to be part of what was going on in the prison in that really immediate way and, and getting my gratification in my life and the thrill, the stimuli that I needed, whether it be thrills or not, but the energy that, that I need to, to live. Because that space was there, I found something different and, and it caused me to kind of stop and it confused me. And that, when I began, to, I began to write. I went back to this empty cell and, and I, there, there was a dictionary there and, and this was after my third escape that I'd been brought back and I looked up the word escape and, and, it, uh, and it said a, a temporary relief from circumstances and it was sort of the word temporary sort of stuck with me. You know, I, I went, I didn't know I was going to writing. I just knew that I was leaving something. I went to my house and, you know, I threw out all my goodies and slammed my door and I, I was going towards something. Um, in the sense that, in the, 
going towards something in the sense that I was moving away from what was. By engaging my mind just with this paper in front of me and, and by engaging my imagination and my creativity and the sustained drive, I actually was able to, you know, just sit fully in, in my own in my own present, in my own now. I think that I have the same instinctual drive that most people have that's around legacy, which is to tell your story. People want to tell their story. It's one of the most compelling uh, drives is to chronicle our past. And part of it also is to vault it into the future. We're all looking for that. We're all looking for that immortality. But to put it there for me was to so that I could move on. And the best laid plans of mice and men, um, you know, things never work out the way we plan them. I got trapped, you know. I was trapped more in that. It was if, because what happened from that was I got attention, and in this culture, you know, that I got, you know, a, a certain degree of fame and, 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 and credit and, and you know, people came and they wanted to talk about the, the process of writing and they wanted to talk about what it was like in prison and what it's like to rob a bank and what to do this and that. And, and I got caught up in the media thing and it became a, a kind of a toxic thing. I became, began to sort of identify myself with it. At another, at the same time, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an unaware person and I knew that I was kind of holding up you know, a puppet over here, and people were talking to the puppet. So I ended up trapped in it. I ended up trapped in, in this, this identity I had built for myself. You know, the real key to life is not so much cycles, but spirals. When we break cycles, when we, when we stop repeating habits and behaviors and routines, then we spiral. So we're still cyclical, but we're, we're moving. And that's, I think, part of the frustration of modern life is that we're, we're aware of these psychological, emotional, and spiritual dead ends that we're hitting all the time. And it's because we're not taking that risk which leaps us into that, into that spiral. And that we will live with the devils we know as opposed to you know, take a risk. in my life and then to re-enter the world is there's a, a transitional time there that's that's um I, I that I have great really great sadness about I remember getting out one time actually out of this prison in 1987 and I'd been in about 13 years I was down on a beach and there was a cormorant drying its its wings and it was um like a visit from God or something it was just this wonderful feeling, and I thought to myself, can I hang on to this? Idle time is, you know, we, we, it's totally been banished from our, our whole way of being and existing in the world as adults. But that used to be a natural part of what we did. Sometimes just idly, you know, whittling a stick and things. And why is that? What is diminished about that?
Time is money. How many times are you going to hear that? Time is money. Time is money. Time isn't money. Money is money. Desire is the cause of all suffering. And it's because desire takes you out of you. It takes you out of your time, your moment, and puts you into the moment of what it is you desire. And that's the whole crux of Western markets, is make people desire these things, think that that's what they really want, and then, then we're outside of our own time. It's sort of, you know, the, the donkey and the carrot is the thing. You know, there's a reason the donkey never gets the carrot, and, and we don't. We don't get those carrots. We always think we do, but we don't. Here we have this one thing in our life. We have this one thing that we could actually control. Control in the sense of control how we, how we want to spend this most precious commodity that we own. And it's the one thing that we don't ever sit in or stay aware of or use properly. You know, there's a need in us. We, you know, we've come from places. We've come from places of sheer, you know, joy, places of, of, of sheer terror places of sheer abandonment. Imagine our ancestors, you know, loping across fields and, you know, doing the things. That, we've done that for thousands and thousands of years. This is all just new to us. And wild time is essential to us. It's like food and water for the soul and the, and the mind. I got out in 1987 um, you know, lived years, really some good quality years for, for quite a while, and then things began to break down in the mid-90s and off and on, and I would pull myself back together a couple of times and things. But in, uh, in 1999, they, um, I got into, uh, that's uh, when I, you know, I talked about letting my life fire, that's when I, you know, re-offended in a spectacular way and had a bank robbery here in Victoria and, you know, had a shootout with the police and, you know, it was just this, you know, incredible, messy, uh, you know, piece of violence. And I was destroying myself again and, and destroying the, the Stephen Reed redeemed bank robber person again and, and returning to something else. In retrospect, to look back at it, it was that way. I didn't have a conscious thing of doing it at the time. So I, I had this sense of, you know, of, of living in time that was just frantic to the tenth degree. It was like, you know, being, you know, ten of those guys on the on the stock floor yelling for bids all at once, all the time, you know, 24 hours a day. So it was this huge, I was you know, with in, injection cocaine. So the chemicals had changed in my actual perception of time. You know, I, I don't, you know, moments were, you know, just so filled with that frantic energy. Ended up in this, as I say, uh, um, you know, a, um, a farce, uh, you know, in, and a not so funny one, but for, for other people, but a farce of a, of a bank robbery and, and a farce of my former self, you know, going into a bank full of sweat and, and all kinds of, and in a real amateur, I was spending four and a half minutes inside of a bank and then leaving. Of course, the police are there waiting for me when I come out and, you know, and you know, having this drive, this getaway through a park and, you know, leaning out the window, firing a shotgun at them and, you know, just all kinds of things. Grace of God, nobody's hurt. I go to jail. So this is the point of the story. 
I go to jail and I am coming down like a Boeing 747. Now time really sucks. You know, it's, I mean, I'm hurting and just every, I can't sleep and every minute is, you know, an eternity. Like every cell in my body is screaming because, you know, I'm really dope sick and, and, and I wake up sober thinking, you know, starting to sober up thinking, what have I just done? About four or five days into that, up shows this guy, a psychiatrist. And what he tells me at that time is, he, and he just says it right out, he just looks at me across the table, we talked for about five or ten minutes, and he says, you're sane, you're fine, you know right from wrong, you know, like the drugs made you crazy, but you know right from wrong. And I said, yeah, of course I am, let's, let's go to trial. And he said that, and he gave me a really great perspective, he said that, your life is now over. You're 50 years old. You're going to jail for a long time. Basically, your life as you know it is over. So what you have here is an opportunity to get put yourself back up, find the grit, put yourself back up on your feet, and live your life for what it is. Because there's a little 10-year-old girl that he had met on the steps coming in, which is my daughter at the time. And she, if you can show her that you can screw up your life in the worst the most terrible way possible and still find your way through it that you're going to give her the greatest gift you could ever give her as a, as a parent so I thought and I hung on I was able to cling to that and that's what kept me it actually kept me alive you know but it gave me a new perspective on all that that it doesn't it was, first of all it wasn't about me anymore and it was about me and it was a perspective on time and what what could be accomplished my and what legacy I could actually could actually leave. Not this legacy of of being this romantic bank robber, not this legacy of, of being, you know, a, a competent novelist or any other things. But I had the one shot at leaving something, you know, with a with a little ten year old girl that she could see that. That's that's legacy. That's that's real legacy that, that that was able to learn only only by you know sinking to the lowest depths that I've ever been at in my life and, uh, and then sort of rising back out of them again. So. <laughs>